The biggest drivers for offline payments in emerging economies all across the continent is first of all the fact that um, cash is still king. Most transactions, 90% of transactions are still done in cash across Africa. This is a huge problem for small medium businesses. It creates issues of theft. It is difficult for them to reconcile their business. And it's also difficult for them to manage their inventory and grow and scale their business. For consumers, it's also a big problem. They have to carry a lot of cash around with them and it's inefficient. So this is a massive opportunity. Additionally, access to finance for small medium businesses is also not there. So those are two big opportunities and I think those are what's going to drive the opportunity to solve offline payments in, in Africa. So when we think about the drivers for offline payments on the continent, we, we almost see different stages of development. Before COVID, we saw a big uptake in digital payments, which was driven by you know, the ability and availability of different fintechs offering uh, good payment methods. We've seen you know, government and private sector drive payment adoption quite nicely as well. And, and then COVID happened, and of course, that created an even bigger impetus for digital payments, where consumers started adopting it, merchants started adopting it for health reasons and even just practical reasons when people were not able to go to shops. But the really interesting thing that we're seeing now is that those behaviors are kind of remaining uh, stable, even, even now that we're sort of at the tail end of this pandemic and consumer behaviors sort of getting back to normal. We're seeing those new payment behaviors remain which is something that we're very, very excited about. And we're seeing, you know, even with our merchants and our consumers, we're seeing the, 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 the preference of digital payments remaining, even in industries and, and, and types of segments that were predominantly cash before the pandemic. And so I think, you know, between the trend that existed before and the pandemic that accelerated it, um, we're, we're going to see a lot of growth on that side. And, and we're very, very excited to be part of that. I would say the biggest drivers of offline payments is... One, it's the default, so it's where we started from as compared to online payments, which is kind of newer technology. And then, so for a lot of people, offline is the first way that they're introduced to a monetary system. So like your parents give you cash as a kid, um, and then you go to physical stores to use it. So that's what you're really used to. Um, some of the biggest drivers are the fact that technology hasn't been adopted everywhere. There are limitations of power, of education, you need to be able to read and write to use a lot of these technologies. Um, and in a lot of places that just isn't true for the majority of people. So that is kind of pushing, it's the first move advantage, right? It's what's pushing offline technologies forward. I believe the biggest drivers of offline payments in emerging economies across Africa are really uh, a couple of things. Number one is accessibility to infrastructure that can enable it, um, particularly for infrastructure that can support validation, and that, that spans across a bunch of things. Um, cell towers, NF, NFC inf um, information, uh, things like that. Second of all, language barriers. Um, sometimes we often uh, uh, underestimate the extent to which um, a large percentage of our country's population does not understand English. And most of the um, applications and other tools make the assumption that people do. And so people sometimes, especially the elderly, want to talk to somebody who speaks in their local language. And um, oftentimes that person can be found in a, in a kiosk somewhere around the world. So when we think about the vision for payments on the continent, we think of it as a frictionless payments journey, both for consumers and for merchants. And what that means is that a consumer should never have to worry, is this merchant going to accept my payment method? A merchant should never have to worry, uh, is the consumer going to have the payment methods that I accept? We really see ourselves as the player who's going to remove friction at that point of pur pur purchase or the exchange, as we call it. And so what we're really uh, working hard towards is getting to a point where uh, we reduce all sorts of frictions around this payment exchange and can create a, a reliable and a, and a trustworthy system that allows consumers and merchants to exchange securely from wherever they are and, and, and fundamentally help small businesses grow. And so we really see ourselves as a player driving that and then building other financial services and general services for small businesses on top to continue helping them grow in many other ways. I, I believe that uh, new entrants really have an opportunity to um, take on offline payments um, with a view to 
um, getting the product in the hands of the man and woman on the street who typically is not financially included. They have to make offline payments mean something for them and give them incentives for using offline payments. So, you know, when, when you walk into your neighborhood corner store, you walk into an open air market, what will convince that boy or girl or that man or woman who's selling at the store that offline payments is something they absolutely need to have. So in the last one year, in the la one or two years in the light of COVID-19, the things that have changed for on offline payments is that we're seeing a lot more people who are willing to try new um, payment models. A lot of people are at home. They don't want to leave their house. They're worried about their own safety. So they have to do things that are out of the ordinary in these extraordinary times. So for example, we're seeing a lot of more people go to online payments as opposed to going to physical stores. And even when they go to physical stores, another behavior change that we're seeing is that they want more contactless payment methods. So you see people trying to pay with USSD or via a transfer from their bank on their mobile apps. So we're seeing this new wave of people who were very hesitant about online payments, um, trying to explore new things and push the boundaries of what they think is a safe way to pay. Innovators in Africa are really focusing around solving the problem country to country, right? Because every country has its own unique characteristics. Um, in Paga Group, as an example, we're very focused on how do we make it simple for consumers and sellers to pay and get paid, shop and sell, right? So in solving and going after offline payments, particularly, we are focusing on the small medium businesses. How do we help them collect payments in efficient ways manage their business and their inventory, reconcile their business at the end of every day, right? Um, and then be able to make payments, right? And this is the things that we are really focused on and saying once we can help with that and we see that as a first step, then it's about how do we offer financial services to them? How do we help them finance their business? That woman who's selling Coca-Cola every day, how do we help her solve that business uh, or access finance to grow her business? So those are the kinds of things that we are focused on solving. Um, I think we've been, we, we, we're developing a thesis around offline payments in particular, and we're looking for startups that are building um, infrastructure to support offline payments, whether they're agent businesses, um, which is kind of one of the biggest elements of our work um, and, and our focus, or, or they're businesses that are building critical infrastructure for making existing offline payment channels safer, like USSD. I think if you're looking at it across the continent and saying how can we solve everywhere, it takes a lot of partnerships, right? Because really payments is, I, I like to think about it as a global local game, right? Um, because you need the last mile, you need to understand the nuances of the last mile, plug into the payments infrastructure on the last mile. So it would take a lot of partnerships across, across various countries, but one of the beauties of cryptocurrency is that it enables us to, to leapfrog some of this. Right? So even with cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency allow us to trade across borders, but ultimately people need on-ramps and off-ramps to fiat for as long as fiat exists, or to central bank digital currencies as long you know, when those exist. Right? So you still need the on-ramps and the off-ramps to be able to drive that, and that's the local side of it. I think the first step, though, is that countries across the continent need to open their mind, for regulators, need to open their mind to cryptocurrency. I'm glad to see Nigeria taking that step with the central bank digital currency. I encourage all the African countries to do that, but also to allow the trading and the dealing in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that really democratize access to financial services. So when building offline payment solutions, I think what people who are looking to start out on this journey need to keep in mind is that offline payment is, is really complex. There are a lot of players in the value chain, depending on the market, there are a lot of different payment methods that need to be supported. And so I think what, what people really need to keep in mind is that there's a lot of complexity. Some markets are easier than others because there's interoperability and things work together more nicely. And other markets are a little bit uh, more complex because things are not integrated, not interoperable. And so a lot of that needs to be built from scratch. Um, but I think the really important thing here is to think about smart partnerships, uh, because what we're starting to see now is that along the entire payments value chain, we're starting to see players coming up that specialize in different parts of the value chain and offer the services, you know, with a simple API. 
And that allows people who want to start off building a financial services product to do so by partnering with the right people rather than having to build the whole um, stack from scratch. And I think that's really something very exciting and that people should embrace because that's really how you build quick uh, MVPs and, and, and how you quickly test your idea. I think I have a conservative one and I have an extreme one. I think um, in this space, the extreme one, I'll start with that, is that we're going to start seeing a lot of closed network payment solutions where corporations in particular areas or people in specific areas are going to build their own payment infrastructure for a particular location. For example, a market may decide to have its own card system that runs just for the people in the market. So um, as opposed to having a bank with an ATM card that you can use all around the world, you may be issued a card that only works in your physical location because those are the people you interact with. Um, the reason I say this is that it requires a lot less infrastructure. You can do it offline completely offline instead of this blended online offline that we use a term that we use a lot um so that's kind of the wild one this closed networks of payments that we're going to see but the from a more conservative um point of view the thing that i think we're going to see is like i said earlier we're going to have a lot of people trying to address what we call the unbanked the people who do not have access to um financial institutions and then there'll be all these companies that are building things specifically or the challenges that those kind of people face. I'm very excited about the next decade. Um, I think uh, the journey is just really at the beginning of where things are taking off. Um, one of the big things that we will see is the digitization of small medium businesses. And at Paga, we're really excited about a new platform that we've launched called Doroki. And that is really focused on helping SMEs collect payments digitally and manage their business, whether it's in a physical location or online. And, and, and this is this an ecosystem that allows them an opportunity to also access financial services, to drive and scale their business. Now, as things progress, I see the opportunity for cryptocurrency to really come in. And I think this is a big game changer. Um, and we will enable that. And Doroki will enable merchants, small, medium businesses to collect payments in cryptocurrency. And I think across Africa, we're going to see more of that happening. Wherever you are in the world watching, I greet you. I thank you so much for watching that. Um, my name is Adigoki Oyeni, and I'm the editor-in-chief at Tech Cabal. And I'll also be your host uh, for this new session. Uh, offline payments and emerging markets. We have a star-studded panelist here with us. Uh, one of them is Tayo Oviosu, who is the CEO and founder of Paga. Uh, a lot of us know that company, leading uh, payment fintech company here, starting from Nigeria and expanding. Uh, Paga, please, uh, Tayo, please come up the stage. We also have Timi Giwa, who is our product manager at Paystack, and they're in charge where she leads the team's work around, you know, offline payments, you know, or in-person payments, like she likes to call it. Um, so please let us welcome her up the stage. Uh, Timmy, please come up. Thank you so very Absolutely. much. We should also have Marcelo Sharma, who leads international expansion at Yoko. Uh, Yoko is a leading Pan-African uh, fintech startup. I don't even think they should be called a startup anymore. You know, they've done crazy rounds, billion-dollar valuations. You know, thank you for joining us, Sharma. Thank you so much. Before we dive right into this panel, uh, nice to meet you guys again, yeah. by the way. Nice to meet you. Um, while doing a lot of audience engagement for this panel, I realized that it, a couple of people actually do not have, or rather have a wrong understanding of offline payments. Mm. It's presumed to be payments without any technological assistance, you know, mm. so maybe handover counter, cash, mm. you know. So I think I'll push this to Tayo. Uh, sure. Just give us what are use cases for offline payments, you know, yeah. how do you define them or characterize them? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me, and this is an amazing event, um, Tech about, so really glad to be here. Um, look, the way I think about offline payments, and I think um, during the, the video someone said it, which is, you know, we start by being physically in person. Um, how do you effect an exchange of value with somebody else? 
right? Um, and, and, and the problem is one that would exist all of time, right? So I'm here physically with you. you. You have something I want to get from you. Maybe I'm buying something from you. How do I exchange value with you? And, and technology really helps with this. Right? So as Tommy was said in his initial presentation, it's their physical notes, right? or with the cow, actually. Right? So cow, when physical notes, coins. Now you can actually use a card to dip into a POS device, right? maybe a Yoko device, a uh, Paga one. Um, you could also use a card to tap and pay. But with the advent of the mobile phone, it gives us the possibility of a variety of other technologies. Right? So when we talk about offline payments, it's about alternative ways of paying, um, whether that's a bank transfer, whether that's a tap to pay, NFC, or sound near field payment. Um, and so there's a lot of technology behind all of this. It's actually quite complex. Um, and, and that is what a lot of companies are working on, Paystack, Paga, Yoko, to solve. Great, great. I mean, I see you nodding there, Timmy. <laughs> Just to segue, my, my next question was directed at you. You know, as a product manager, I guess you've worked directly with uh, coming up with these solutions. You know, so what are some of the challenges? Um, he said they were complex, and you really nodded. You know, so what are, what are some of those challenges that you've come across, or you know, that are just stop or proven uh, difficult to roll out this kind of solution, offline payment solutions? Yeah. I think, like Tayo said, oh, first, thank you for having me. Um, but I really agree with, with what Tara said. What we call offline payments is a lot of times anything but, right? I like to refer to in-person payments. There is a lot of technology and infrastructure that goes into even cash payments. Like you have to have these industries that actually print the money, move it around. Um, so I think one of the biggest barriers um, is really cost and infrastructure, especially in this part of the world, right? Because you're talking about technology that not everyone has access to. Um, and people have different levels of access. And yet, you still have to create this uniform mm -hmm. platform that people in like the US can communicate and trade with people in the furthermost village in Zamfara. Um, and the infrastructure to make that happen can be very, very expensive. And it requires a lot of collaboration from a lot of partners. So I would say the biggest barrier is the cost of the infrastructure itself and then the level of education of people who have to use this system. The beauty of cash is that you hand it to someone, it's easy to understand. Most people can see color and they can identify notes that way. But when you move to technology, you're saying, okay, do you understand how the internet works? Do you, can you read and write? Even simple things like that. So there are all these barriers to entry that a lot, we take it for granted when you live in places like um, Cape Town or Lagos. There are things you take for granted that just aren't true for the rest of the world. And I think those are the things that are really holding back. Okay, that. so let yes. me follow up on that question. Sure. Uh, so what exactly are companies like Paystack doing to solve those problems? I mean, so for infrastructure, I guess, <laughs> is it, do we have to wait for the government? Or, you know, what are we doing? In terms of user education, you know, what's, what are you guys doing? I don't think we have to wait for the government. If you look at a lot of the payment infrastructure that exists today, they're not government funded or facilitated. Mm. Cards started out with people in large department stores wanting to pay on credit, right? And they would write down like your little department store number and then they would send it via fax to head office to see if you had credit and you waited 10 minutes, right? So I really do think that it's private sector investment that will really drive these things forward. And one of the things that Paystack is doing, and Shola said earlier, is building the infrastructure that allow private companies um, like Chipper Cash, like Paga, like all these other companies um, to reach these people and build infrastructure for them on a global scale as, and a local scale as well. Uh, so my next question is directed at Marcello. Uh, is he here? So in terms of uh, international expansion, what are some of the difficulties or um, quirky experiences that you've had uh, expanding from South Africa to other African markets? You know, what are those experiences? Differences in policies, uh, consumer behavior, you know, and how are you merging and solving those challenges? Um, so, so I was saying what's interesting about when you, when you think about 
offline payments in the context of, of new markets is that all of these complexities and challenges um, are then essentially compounding as you go into new markets, right? So when you talk about the, um, uh, let's start with consumer behavior and consumer payments. So as you go into different markets, different markets have different consumer behaviors. So in South Africa, um, cards are fairly well, well used. Um, whereas if you go into East Africa, mobile money is much stronger. If you go into West Africa, there's some markets with more money, some markets with bank transfers are, are, are good. There's other markets with, you know, uh, other other players who've, who've, who've taken up quite nicely on the consumer side. So you're navigating different consumer behavior to begin with. And the consumer behavior is what fundamentally uh, drives the merchant need for digital payment acceptance. So as we see different markets have different um, payment methods, um, what we need to offer to a merchant to accept um, to create a, a good value proposition also changes. So that's kind of the first part of the equation you need to solve. Then there's of course lots of operational and legal and regulatory stuff around, you know, how do you get licenses in different markets? They're sometimes called differently, the process is different, the timeline can be long. So I think that's that's of course a, a big part of, of, of also entering uh, new markets and which, which can make it tricky to enter new markets. But I think fundamentally the question you need to answer is how do you build a value proposition um, that removes uh, friction for the for the merchant and creates, um, you know, I think like both the other panelists were saying, essentially creates a, an, an easy acceptance experience for the merchant. And that proposition looks different in different markets. And so as a company, the way you want to think about it is, um, you know, you, 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 you need to be able to allow different acceptance methods in different markets um, so that you can make sure that whatever you offer is, uh, you know, relevant and, and, and useful independent of the, the location that you go to. Something wrong. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, we're running out of time. I, if you have any questions, do we have any questions yet? Q&A on Slido, please let's drop our questions. Um, on Zoom, please let's drop them. Oh, great. Uh, we have a question here for... Okay, Tayo has mentioned Doro Key. Could we have a further explanation of it. Yeah. So Doroki is um, a, pr a product that Paga is launching. Um, we already have it out in the market, over 5,000 merchants on it. And essentially, it does what Marcelo was saying, which is it allows any merchant multiple acceptance methods. You can accept card payments with an MPOS. You can accept bank transfers, QR code, USSD payments. Um, and also, we will have a near field sound payment, um, which is going to be the first of its kind across Africa. Um, and so we're really excited about the commercial launch of Doroki, where, where the commercial launch is next month. Uh, but we've actually been using it in the field. You can go to the Android uh, Play Store and download Doroki. So Doroki is for any merchant. But what we have done as a company at Paga is actually build the infrastructure and opened up all of the APIs that Doroki is using to anyone else to innovate upon. So everything I just described, any other company can innovate on it, leveraging Paga's APIs. Cool, cool. Um, sorry, please, questions? I'd like to take more questions, yeah. Uh, what's the risk fa factor when it comes to possible bad actors who try to use offline systems <laughs> as an avenue to defraud um, <laughs> as an avenue to defraud the merchants, how do you mitigate this? I push this to Timmy. <laughs> See, jump question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, when it comes to offline payments, I think there are a lot of things that you can do to try to mitigate fraud, right? So there will always be bad actors from here to as long as we're, we're human, there will always be bad actors. But the one thing that we found that has been very powerful is that most bad actors have patterns. So they keep coming up with new patterns, but the patterns still do exist. So one of the things that we try to do at Paystack is detect these patterns early and protect our merchants. Then there's a second part of it where it's a, it's a very education focus. Um, as a merchant, as a customer, you need to know what bad behavior looks like so you can identify it early. And then you also need to have a sense of security in the products that you use and know that even if I'm a victim, that I'm still covered. So I think those are the kind of two ways that I like to think of protecting people in offline payments. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're sort of out of time. We still have a couple of questions. 
Uh, okay, so let's just take this quickly. This is for Tayo, Paga, and uh, Sherma. Okay, yeah. Please shed more light on how you sync cash payments where Trader is not illiterate with digital payments and credit access for SME. For Tayo, Paga, and Sherma. Please shed more light. Yeah, do you want Sherma to take a look? Yeah. You're on mute. <laughs> All right. Cool. I'm, 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 I'm happy to, to take Go for this. It. I, yeah. I hope I'm, I'm understanding it uh, correctly. But I think the, the, what, so what, what would we allow to do at, at Yoko is we allow a merchant to kind of consolidate both their digital payments and uh, cash payments in the same application. So that kind of allows them to uh, you know, track, track everything that, that they do and all the, the sales that they make. Um, what we realize is that, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of a literacy component, but then there's also like a business, for lack of a better word, a business literacy component. Mm -hmm. And what we often see is that people are actually quite business savvy and, mm -hmm. and, and, and quite savvy in terms of how to run their business yep. and often how to run their finances, um, even if they might not be super, super comfortable using technology and, 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 and all of these things. So even in businesses that are completely offline, you see people, you know, T taking stock in their mm -hmm. books and managing um, their, uh, their their sales on a, on a paper booklet and, mm -hmm. and spreadsheet. So you know you, you do see people have uh, most of the times actually fairly uh, sophisticated ways of, of managing the business in the grand scheme of things. And then what we try and do is we kind of try and take some of these tried and tested things into a digital environment. And I think what you start seeing is that if people feel that the systems they're using are still kind of similar and comfortable to them, then the transition from offline to digital becomes easier. And the uh, the incentive to doing so also becomes becomes more. So, you know, I think the point here is probably not don't necessarily reinvent the wheel, but really make it easy for people to transition from the digital into the online from the offline into the online space and make sure that uh, that there's an incentive for them to do so. And when they do, they grow. And then I think the, the business literacy and the, the business savviness of the merchants will then actually teach them how to do this because they realize that you know by going digital, they might end up making more sales, more money, save costs, and, and fundamentally grow their business. So I think if you if you build the product right and if you make sure that you you build the, the ramp from offline to online properly, then um, I think that transition is still not easy, but a little easier. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, last words before we leave. Uh, Tayo, any last words? Yeah, I mean, um, am I on? Yeah, I, I think for me, I'm, I'm really excited about, I, I like actually how you said in-person payments rather than even saying offline payments. I'm excited about the future of that because um, it's, it's still going to be the biggest part of retail for a long time to come. And um, I'm excited about the innovation that's coming through on this. Timmy? I think I'm most excited about just the creative ways that we as Africans are going to solve our mm -hmm. own problems. Yeah. Um, with all these companies building all this infrastructure, I'm really excited about developers, merchants, everybody in the space just saying, hey, I can solve this for this group of people and then scaling it across the entire continent. I think that's what's most, most exciting for me. Just what will people build? On the final note, how long do you think it would take before we have like contactless payments, really, really reliable contactless payments? Well, there are two different things. So one is reliable in that does it work, right? Um, look, in the next month, we're going to publicly launch that, right? It works. So it's now more about the question is how long would it take for you to have people having enough phones that, can, that that works on and the terminals, et cetera. I, I think it's in the next five years. We're going to have across the country, right? Because remember, in Nigeria at least, all your, all your debit cards are now contactless. Mm. So really, it's a move to get all the terminals contactless oh, cool. and, and cool. get people aware of it. Um, so I think we're going to see the move for QR. I think we're going to see more consistency in applications around QR. And we're going to see people moving more towards that direction. Yeah. Cool, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We've now come to the end of this session. Uh, I can't wait. Next five years. I can't wait. Uh, uh, the next session is the future of money with Ria Yusuf. Uh, if you're online, all you just need to do is just log out, get out the Zoom link. Uh, there's a new instruction on how to get to the next one. Uh, so you just wait for a couple of minutes. If you're here, I mean, just sit back, relax, and just listen to good music.
Thank you so much. Network, meet people. Thank you so much. Thank you.